Thank you very much. Um, I'm really glad I didn't get the slot straight after lunch, which is when most people fall asleep. So I hope you guys were able to get a coffee before you got here. Uh, as you can see, there's uh, hashtags and my Twitter handle. So if you want to heckle me on LinkedIn or uh, sorry, Twitter, please, by all means, do so. So I'm going to talk to you about how to unfuck the customer experience of digital security. When I wrote to Miles about this presentation, I wasn't sure whether I'm allowed to use this title. Um, and he was like, no, actually, that's a really good idea. And the reason why I use this title is because digital security and authentication as a customer experience topic is probably one of the most boring things you can think of, right? Because who's out there from a CX perspective who really loves you know, passwords and shit like that, right? So anyway, that's why I put that title up there. And hopefully throughout the presentation, I'm gonna show you how we can unfuck the CX of it. So, but before we start, I always start my presentations with um, a confession or full disclosure, okay? First of all, I swear a lot. Um, that's because I'm extremely passionate about what I do. I've been doing UCD, CX, UX, human computer interaction, whatever the fuck the acronyms are for a long time, and I love it. Uh, and that, when I get excited, I swear I drop an F-bomb or an S-bomb or something, so I hope you're not gonna get offended. I don't mean to offend. The other thing that I need to uh, disclose to you is that anything that I'm presenting here isn't really my creation, okay? This is stuff that I've learned from other people, from stuff that I've read, stuff that I've collated. Very little of it is actually purely original, except that I combine it with swearing a lot, okay? So again, having worked in academia, it's not my thing. Um, <clears throat> special thanks. Um, a lot of the work that is in this presentation has actually been done by two fellas at Lloyd's called uh, Marcus Alexander and Miles Sampson, who were involved in the CX principal work, so thank you to them. Um, and I think that's all the confessions I have to make. Oh, no, sorry, one last confession. Um, because obviously I'm swearing, whatever I'm saying is my opinion, my opinion only, and not that of my employer. I kind of have to say that for you know legal reasons. But anyway, let's crack on. <clears throat> how do we get here? Okay, so let's do a little bit of a, a scene setting of you know, how we get here when it comes to digital security. First of all, big ass vault. Um, when it comes to money, we generally give money to banks so they keep it safe for us. Historically, that's what we've done because they have massive vaults, they have security, they have locks, they have all that good stuff so that other people can't access our money, right? So effectively, we're outsourcing the security to banks, okay? Now, unfortunately, that of course makes vaults targets, right? Now, these days, heists are kind of cool, right? Because, hey, if you're stealing from a bank, you're only stealing from a big-ass corporation, and you're not stealing from, you know, poor old granny with her life savings, right? However, these days, identity theft, not so cool. Now, as we've shifted to digital, um, banks still keep our money safe, and these days also our data, hopefully, right? No big leakages or anything, no Cambridge Analytica with massive banks just yet. Um, but because of the convenience of being able to access our bank's uh, services, our money, et cetera, 24-7, uh, wherever we are, on a multitude of devices, um, we now have a role to play in digital security, okay? That means we have passwords, we have pins, we have memorable information, we have all this kind of stuff that kind of blocks other people from getting access to our money, and that stuff is hard, okay? I mean, how many times has, you know, your partner or your mom called you going like, oh, shit, I forgot my password again, and I can't log in. And hey, do you remember the last password that I had on this or this or this? And I haven't even started talking about two-factor authentication yet, but more on that later. It's hard. Digital security isn't easy. Now, when did you last think this? <laughs> How many of you use strong passwords? Show of hands. Okay, well, hey, nerds, love it. Okay, so most of you actually use strong passwords. How many of you love strong passwords? How many of you use a password manager? Again, quite a lot of you, because strong, parts, strong passwords are fucking difficult to remember, right? Because as, as, it, as, as our minds, as human, we're not made to remember something that is 12 characters long, has an upper and a lower case, a number and some special characters, and no two consecutive same characters and some shit like that, right? We're just not good at that, okay? So when it comes to security, strong passwords is not a good thing for us. Unfortunately, there's some bad news. It's only gonna get worse. Well, sort of. Um, 
There's a new regulation in place uh, coming out of open banking, et cetera, that requires banks to implement what they call strong customer authentication for a lot of the interactions that we're going to have with our banks. SCA, strong customer authentication, is effectively the equivalent of two-factor authentication. So whenever I use one or the other, I use them interchangeably. And um, it means that because of two-factor authentication, you're going to have to step up. So let me explain what step up actually is. What the heck is step up? Well, first of all, it is a series of dance movies. <laughs> I've watched three of five. Um, however, it also means that you have to authenticate twice whenever you interact on certain journeys with your bank. Um, and that's even if you're logged in, right? So you've gone through the pain of putting in your strong password that you got from your strong password manager, and then, well, I'm gonna have to do something else. So how does that work? Um, it basically means that out of how, how this works is something I know. So this is the classic thing, all right? Um, like a PIN, password, memorable information. Um, something I have, number two. Um, so that could be like a, my phone or a token or a card reader or something like that that you know, allows me to enter something else. And it could be something I am. And now this one is super interesting, right? Because something I am is effectively biometrics, right? This is touch ID, face, iris scanning. Your ear, supposedly, is actually a fairly unique thing to people. So you could technically use that as a you know, biometric check. Uh, gait analysis. The way I walk across this stage is very unique to me, obviously, especially if I do jazz hands. Um, but in order to do two-factor authentication, I need to do two out of three of these things. So I could potentially log into my internet banking apps, and then when I do something else that requires two-factor authentication, boom, I'm gonna have to put in something else, like something I have or something I am. And I'm gonna show you a few scenarios later on. So, but why? Why do we have to do this? Well, we have to do it because there is a regulation. Any of you have heard of open banking? That's kind of a silly question at a fintech design summit. Yeah, of course you've heard about open banking. But because of open banking, we now have a new payment services director, which includes a regulatory technical standard, which has, in a nutshell, uh, a law that says we have to implement two-factor uh, two authentication. So I'm not going to bore you with the details on that. So when does it need to be in place? Boom, by the end of 2019. So by the end of 2019, for, and this is at Lloyds Bank that I know of, we need to implement two-factor authentication for 50 customer journeys. That's 50 times when somebody has to you know, step up. Now, when do you have to step up? First of all, online banking. When I access sensitive data in my online banking, I'm gonna have to log in with my password potentially, and also authenticate with biometrics, or maybe get a one-time passcode, or you know, any combination thereof. Um, Electronic payments of a certain value, if it's you know, more than a specific amount, you're gonna have to step up again to double check that um, you, know, you actually wanna do this. And high risk journeys. Now this is a kind of a blanket term for things like, um, I don't know, you wanna look at your transactions that are more than 90 days old, boom, step up. And there's a few others, like I said, there's around 50 journeys when you have to step up, but I'm not gonna bore you with the details. Read the RTS, you're gonna fall asleep like there's no tomorrow. Um, when don't you have to step up? So low value remote payments, right? So if it's under, I think, 30 euros or so, we're not gonna make you step up. Contactless payments, obviously that would kind of defeat the purpose of contactless, the convenience of paying for your latte um, with just a card tap. Um, trusted payees, so people that you've paid before, your buddy that you always send money for beer, you pay them once you've set them up and unattended payment terminals. So whenever you go park in a parking garage or at the airport, obviously you're not gonna do two-factor authentication when you're leaning out of the car or something like that. And again, a few others, but in a nutshell, that's kind of you know, when you don't have to step up. So why should I care? Why should you as designers care? So first of all, we have to care because we have to use it. There's not gonna be a way around it. If you are a banking services provider, you provide cards or anything like that, you're just gonna have to do it, okay? And there's a danger that if you do it badly, uh, that authentication process can just double the pain of authentication. Remember when I asked you about strong password and I was just like, oh God. You know, imagine you have to do that twice, right? Um, authentication as such, when it comes to digital banking, especially, and this is where the FinTech stuff is super important, um, stops or enables banking. 
right? If I can't log into my internet banking, well, I'm not going to be doing any banking. I mean, if I can't log into Monzo or Starling or any of them, I'm just gonna, not going to be able to use the services properly as they were intended. And what we need to consider there is that we have different customers with different needs. So when I talk about 50 journeys that I'm aware of at Lloyd's, that is for retail customers, that's for small business customers, and that's for corporate customers. And just within retail, there's you know the Instagram generation that is like hooked on their mobile phone 24-7 versus literally my mother, who has an iPhone, but most of the time uses it to send SMS. Okay, so whether she had a feature phone or a smartphone wouldn't make a difference. Okay, so you have a huge variety of people and their needs that you need to consider um, when thinking about authentication. Um, and hopefully, um, a few of you are part of that design process that is going to put that in place, right? Um, well, some of you anyway. Now, how are we going to solve this riddle, this problem? Okay, I'm thinking, well, designers to the rescue. Now, I put CX, UX, service, UI, don't give a shit what acronym you use because, you know, depending on the time of the year or which year it is, today it's CX, last year it was service design, before it was UX, before it was HCI, then it was UCD, don't give a shit. It is people-centric design, right? You're thinking about people and their needs, okay? And those people are hopefully gonna help us sort this mess out. And of course, don't forget, product owners, and all the other stakeholders that are part of the process of implementing this, right? It's not just the guys who rock up with you know, their sneakers and their um, ironic t-shirts, but it's actually anybody that is involved in the design process because they influence it. So what's next? First of all, a lot of work has already been done. We know a lot about, obviously, passwords. We know a lot about biometrics and how people interact with that and all that good stuff. Um, Forrester's actually says that by, the, by 2020, we're not gonna have simple passwords anymore, right? Because we're gonna have robust biometrics in place, two-factor authentication all over the place. So, you know, the, the usual just, you know, what's your password is probably gonna be dead by 2020. Um, now, we've also come up with a bunch of experience principles that hopefully should help um, guide the design process and, you know, the ultimate journey design here. What are those four principles? Well, it, uh, simplicity and accessibility, onboarding and education, context and intelligence, and ownership of security. I'm gonna go into each one of them and show you a few examples of how companies are currently already doing that. And later on, I'm gonna actually show you some real life scenarios of how we could implement these journeys with these principles in mind. So, simplicity and accessibility. First of all, consider those with disabilities. So we had a great uh, insight about people who are blind, for instance. Um, and of course, physical disabilities is one thing, but don't forget there's also mental disabilities that you need to think of uh, you know, when it comes to average reading age. I mean, as banks, we're really struggling to make our text that we present to customers customer friendly, right? That's one thing. Um, guide me, help me focus basically means don't overwhelm me with stuff, okay? You know, don't give me too many options. Tell me exactly what you want me to do. Um, and make sure that there's no dead ends, no fails, right? Or if I fail, I fail safely. There's, you know, the equivalent of control Z, undo. Control Z is my favorite shortcut, it's the best thing ever, right? If there's a control Z for everything in life, that'd be great. So, examples. Um, Curve, how many of you use Curve? Curve, a ah, handful, okay. Curve is a little um, card aggregator. You load up your cards and then you can choose which one you want to use and then basically it just tells you how much money you're spending. Whenever you log in, uh, you can either say, hey, you use the password or use a magic link, which will send you. Magic link, Monzo also uses that. I'm pretty sure um, Revolut does the same thing. But it gives me a choice. I don't have to remember um, my password. Um, ask me one thing at a time, classic Google example. It first asked me for my username, then it asked me for my password, not two things at the same time. Um, and no dead ends, so even if I forget my password, I need to do recovery, there's multiple options, right? There's a recovery email, there's two, multiple recovery phone numbers, there's all kinds of things that I can fall back on in order to recover that. It's not completely fail safe. I tried to recover my mum's Gmail at some point and literally I couldn't do it for about an hour until she remembered her actual password. Who would have thought? Um, Onboarding and education. So this is, again, really, really important. We want to prepare people for the fact that SCA is coming, right? So we want to prepare them for it as early as possible. And when I say as early as possible, I mean now. I said it needs to be in place by 2019, but the fact that you know, two-factor authentication is coming needs to be, well, 
told to the world. And at the moment, I think the latest stats are that there's only about 18% of people who use two-factor authentication and banking. That's not a lot. Um, educate me along the way. So I want to make sure that you know we tell people about the benefits of doing something in the particular context, right? It's not about boom, here's a 50-page brochure and here's what you need to know about um, two-factor authentication, or even the word two-factor authentication, but tell me when it's appropriate. And talk to me in ways that I recognize. So use customer-friendly language, you know? Don't, you know, use legalese when you don't have to. Example here, so Revolut tells you about um, features and things that have changed as you're using the app, right? So a great example of how I get clarity early. Um, educate me along the way. PayPal tells you, turn on notifications so you can do this, 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 and this. There's loads of other examples of other fintechs that do that along the way. Um, uh, use the right language. So Monzo's um, uh, uh, tone of voice guidelines, they're famous by now in terms of how they speak to customers, right? They don't drown them in legalese. Um, I think to one guy um, who was supposed to upgrade to his bank account, they literally wrote him a poem, which was quite cool. I saw that on Twitter, really liked that. And um, the one thing I need to check, though, is uh, one of my editorial guys at Lloyd's said, yes, the tone of voice is great, but the readability of it, the readability score of it from an editorial perspective isn't that great. So I, I need to double check that. Context and intelligence. So, you know, we have all these machines behind us, all this coding behind us to tell us, you know, hey, they're going to do this, 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 and this. So um, we want to make sure that, first of all, there's no surprises, right? Tell me when something happens, why, et cetera, so I'm prepared for it. Um, be contextual to mean my activity, right? So if, if I'm in a jungle with a feature phone, don't try to send me something that only works on a smartphone, for instance. Because you know what my customer journeys are, make sure that you predict what I'm likely to do next, right? So if I'm going to set up a new payee, for instance, I'm likely to want to pay them, right? Don't ask me to, well, do three steps to get there, basically. Example there is... <clears throat> Again, uh, Monzo, if the card's not going to work for whatever reason, they tell them in advance, right? Take another card just in case, right? They're proactive about it, which is actually really, really positive for customers. Um, now, Metro Bank, for instance, when you log in, tells you how many times some there have been logins before, if there have been any unsuccessful logins, right? Again, useful to know just in case you suddenly realize 50 times somebody tried to log into your, to your account and failed. Well, if they fail, that's a good thing, but at least you know somebody tried to hack your account. Um, and then finally, predict what's next. So Coconut, for instance, a uh, accounting software tells you, hey, there's going to be a particular deadline coming up, so you might want to think about that sort of thing. And again, as financial services providers, we can predict these sorts of things and help customers, right? So when it comes to strong customer authentication, one of the things that you have to do is you have to step up every 90 days. We can tell people, hey, three days to go, 20 days to go, do you want to step up now? You know. Get the person in control. Uh, ownership of security um, is all about um, showing people what's best for them in the particular context and a device, right? So like I said before, you know, if I have a smartphone, great, let me use that smartphone. If I have a computer with a camera and a microphone, again, let me use that if that's, if that's appropriate. Um, let me choose my method of, of authentication. This is really important. Um, because we're going to have three potential ways to authenticate, and within that multiple others, it's useful to say, hey, you can do this, 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 and this. Right? Brilliant. Well, I'm going to choose the one that I know I can do, because I don't, can't remember my fucking strong password. And then finally, give me full visibility of, uh, and control of my security. Right? So make me understand what I can and can't do, um, and make it possible for me to control what I want to do and what I don't want to do. An example here, Reddit, if you go onto um, their uh, website with a mobile device, they will say, hey, open it up in an app. You know, Here's the benefits, why you want to do that. Right? So show me what works best for me and my device. Um, <clears throat> let me choose without sacrificing convenience. So Monzo allows me to choose the levels of security that I want to have. So location-based security, for instance, my wife is going off on holiday and I know she's going to be in Cyprus. Um, I don't want location-based security turned on because suddenly that card would be blocked because my phone's here and she's in Cyprus. So I want to make sure that it still works, right? And then finally, another example from Google. Your security center in Google tells you 
all of the different things that are happening when it comes to security, right? All the devices that are logged in, the locations, logins, etc., all in one place. So if you want to, you can have a complete visibility of that. Cool. So what does that mean in practice? Now, this is where I want to actually show you some banking scenarios that we've come up with of how two-factor authentication or strong customer authentication could work. Um, there's three scenarios. Number one, pay someone new. Number two, forgotten username and password. It happens all the time. And then there's like the, a little bit something new, using Alexa to you know, do banking. So meet Paul. Paul went out with a friend, and they went to a restaurant that only took cash. He didn't have any cash, so his buddy paid for him, and he wants to pay him back for the food, right? So what does Paul do? He logs into his uh, mobile banking app. Now, because it's on his device, which was previously recognized, he doesn't need to remember like a username or a customer number or something like that. The device is already bound. Um, now, unfortunately, he doesn't remember his password, as, we, as often happens, so we're going to give him another method to um, authenticate. So he's going to say, ah, fine, I'm going to use Touch ID because I've previously registered that. His Touch ID instead. Boom, logged in, and now the system says, hey, you've just logged in with Touch ID. Do you want to do that next time? Because, hey, you can't remember your password like most people. So just, yeah, that's probably a good idea. Um, he goes to want to pay his friend and uh, fills in all the details. And because this is one of those, it's a new recipient, haven't paid him before, we're going to have to step up. He's going to say, OK, we're going to have to um, ask you to, to step up in this case. And he chooses to get a phone call where they tell him a code, and he enters that code, um, and now the payment's on the way. So what happened here? Um, first of all, um, simplicity and accessibility, we gave him an alternative authentication method when he, didn't wanna, when he didn't remember his password. Second of all, um, the steps were fairly simple and self-contained and weren't overwhelming, right? You chose a method and you had to do one thing at a time. Um, we only used relevant authentication methods, right? So we didn't want to do something that only works on desktop when you're just on your mobile. Um, and um, we gave him the control to say, hey, you can save your security option for next time. Next example, James. James can never remember his username or password, and he's staying at his girlfriend um, where he wants to log into his internet banking. Now, um, he goes onto a computer, and she's already registered there, but he doesn't want to use her account, so he's like, no, I want to use another account. Um, and of course, username, who the hell remembers uh, their username? So he doesn't remember what it is. So he says, okay, I want to use something different. So he says, okay, I'm going to start with my account details. Now, because he has a card which has his account details on it, he enters those. He um, then moves on and enters some personal details. Um, and that's all good. Now, you could rightly say, hold on, Phil. Stealing somebody's personal details and account details is fairly easy to do. So how the hell is that going to be secure? Well, uh, we're going to say, yeah, James, uh, we're good. But because you don't have your password here, we're going to give you another method to log in. Right? And this time, he's going to go for voice recognition, which, again, he's registered before. And um, because he's on his girlfriend's computer, it's a microphone. So he says, yep, speak into the microphone this particular phrase. Hi, I'm James. I'm a Lloyd's customer. He recognizes it, and he's logged in. Okay? So what's happened here? First of all, we're helping James with the identification process when he couldn't remember his password. Um, we're giving him alternative options you know, to choose from uh, when you know, one of the others wasn't available or he couldn't do it. Um, we're, again, only giving, the, giving him the relevant authentication methods. He's on a laptop that has a microphone or a camera. If, you, you know, if, it, if we recognize that you have a camera, you could do Face ID, for instance, from the laptop. Um, and if he wanted to, we could bind his username to that computer should he want to do that again next time. He's not going to, but that's fine. Final scenario is Jessica, who is uh, doing an Alexa journey. Now, Alexa wants to pay somebody um, via uh, you know, her internet banking, and she's talking to Alexa and giving her all the instructions, basically. Now, Alexa at that point recognizes that that person hasn't been uh, uh, registered with her. So she's like, OK, what do you want to do now? And she's going to say, I'm going to log into my app. At that point, she gets a push notification, boom. And because of that, she logs straight into her app with Touch ID. 
and she confirms on the, um, on the app that this is her who wants to pay somebody via Alexa, and the payment is on the way, right? Now, voice, Alexa, that sort of thing isn't that commonplace yet, but I think it's definitely something that we're gonna see more and more of. So what happened here? Um, first of all, we gave her a clear solution to you know, when the recipient wasn't found. Secondly, we told her why, the, why we can't make the payment immediately. Um, we gave her a push notification on the, her selected uh, channel of choice. Um, and then finally, it was easy to understand step by step all the things that she needs to do in order to get this going. Now, when she's done all of that, because the recipient has already been saved, she can pay somebody via Alexa without having to step up next time. So hopefully that's gonna be more convenient. So now that you've seen the scenarios, you've seen the principles, um, where are we gonna go from here? Well, um, as designers, uh, we're gonna have to step up, right? We're gonna have to go into a domain which again, isn't terribly sexy or exciting and actually see how we can well, unfuck that, basically. And I'm hoping that these kind of principles would help you untangle, unfuck that. Now, um, like I said, hopefully you've got some ideas from here. Um, but the thing to consider with these principles is three important phases. First of all, uh, you want to consider the before, right? This is from now until SCA hits us. We need to educate people. We need to prepare people for the fact that it is coming. Then, of course, there's the during. We need to create usable solutions which are intuitive and then, you know, this is the UX bread and butter kind of stuff. And then finally, we also need to consider the after. We wanna do positive reinforcement. Whenever you've done something right, whenever you've completed two-factor authentication, we wanna give you, you know, the metaphorical high five, woohoo, well done, you know, because we wanna encourage people to not be scared of it next time. I mean, ideally, we want them to be advocates of two-factor authentication. Now, I don't think anybody's really ever gonna go like, yeah, I love two-factor authentication, boom, you know, recommend it to your friends, NPS score, 10 out of 10. Don't think that's gonna happen. But if they're not pissed off about it, that's already a good start. Kind of if it disappears, you know, that's actually a really, really good start for us if you don't have to think about it. So, what'll happen soon is simple passwords or crap, but they're gonna die soon, okay? We know that. Um, biometrics, smartphones, all that good stuff will be completely commonplace. So smartphones obviously are commonplace, but biometrics, a couple of years ago, even touch ID used to be science fiction. Now, it's actually fairly commonplace. Face ID is starting to get commonplace. There's other ways which are gonna get more commonplace. And ultimately, I think that will lead to three things. First of all, um, more choice for authentication methods, right? Because the password's dead, we can do a whole raft of other things to actually get you authenticated, which is great. Um, that in itself is actually gonna increase security. And that's a good thing because as customers, we want banks to keep our money in our data safe, right? So increased better authentication is a good thing. We want that. Um, yet at the same time, because we're gonna do biometrics and you just recognize me on the phone or I'll send you a code that you don't have to remember, it's less user effort. So boom, that's a fantastic thing. And what's the result? <sighs> Happy customers, woohoo! Okay, so fireworks, that's actually you know, a good thing and everybody wants happy customers. And out of that, to conclude, actually two-factor two authentication hopefully can be good if implemented correctly. And that is all I have for you today. Here's all my handles and everything. Please tweet, please come speak to me, get me a beer, happy to talk. Thank you very much.